Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching Tesla Time News. Episode 244 on Now You Know. We're brought to you, as always, by our amazing Patreon patrons. Uh, we have a lot of great perks over on Patreon, so you can help support the show and get something for it. So head over to patreon.com slash now you know. We'd really appreciate it. And we're sponsored by BigBattery.com with the best battery prices in the USA, guaranteed. If you've got something you need to power from homes to cars, RVs to boats, and much more, BigBattery.com has you covered, offering the newest battery tech. Use the code now you know to save 5% off your purchase today at BigBattery.com. This episode is sponsored by Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that makes it easier and more affordable for men to treat their male pattern baldness online. Did you know that two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? I'm living proof of that. The best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. With Keeps, a licensed doctor will review your information online and recommend the right hair loss treatment plan for you. Then your treatment is shipped right to your door every three months. Keeps offers generic versions of the FDA-approved medications for hair loss, which makes it more affordable. Find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors and why hundreds of thousands of men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash now you know, or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash now you know. And before we get started today, I want to say Happy Mother's Day to my mom. We're recording this on Mother's Day. I want to say Happy Mother's Day to you, Mom. And Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers watching. Very excited about this year. All right, so let's get into these stories this week. I think everyone in Tesla Nation can breathe a big sigh of relief. Elon did a great job on Saturday Night Live on Saturday night. As good as could be expected, and I would argue even better. Here's Elon working in the famous Studio 8H in a writer's meeting, getting ready for the show. And let's go through the skits real quick. So there was the opening monologue where Elon said that he's the first host of SNL, and there have been hundreds, to have Asperger's. And this is the first time that I can recall that Elon has actually talked about this. I mean, especially publicly. And what a big stage to do it on. I yeah. mean, you're literally Saturday Night Live, like a huge live event. He could have brought this up at like a tiny little rocket conference. He could have brought this up at some kind of, you know, EV event. Instead, he brings it up on Saturday Night Live, which I think, you know, he kind of has to do because as he mentioned, you know, he kind of talks a little funny and people might not understand why he talks like that. Maybe he's not being sincere. He explained, that's just the way my brain works. I think that that was a really big thing for him to do. It's it's really inspiring, I think, for people who uh, have Asperger's. Yeah, I mean, 37 million people that are estimated to have it around the world. That's 0.5 percent of the population. It's right. not a small number. Um, and that's just the people who are pretty much diagnosed, uh, many people go undiagnosed. And I think that immediately warmed up the audience to him by, you know, showing that he's human. And I mean, yeah, he was self-deprecating, but he also talked about his dreams for sustainable energy and life on Mars and, and being a multiplanetary species. I think that that was really important, too, to kind of um, have a little bit of sincerity in his opening monologue. Not a lot of monologues are that sincere yeah. on SNL. Usually, you know, this person is an actor and they know how to tell a bunch of jokes. And so and they plug their latest movie. Right. And it's like, and you're going to want to see me in the next <laughs> Avengers film. <laughs> It's usually hilarious, but I think that it was it was really nice that he was able to be a little bit more sincere, talk about some things that were important to him. Yeah, then Elon brought out his mom, May Musk, to join him for a funny, awkward, but heartwarming Mother's Day moment where he talked about himself as a kid and he promised his mom a Mother's Day gift of, wait for it, Dogecoin. So after the opening monologue, we got a Lucid Air commercial and a Ford Mach-E commercial. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. Uh, but then we got the Gen Z hospital where Elon played a doctor that spoke Gen Z. And I think that he did a pretty good job yeah. uh, on, the, on the skit. I mean, it seemed like he hit all of his lines. Uh, the timing didn't have to be perfect because they're all speaking, <laughs> you know, Gen Z. And we're all oh, lit, fam. You capping with me right now? You capping. He was not capping. <laughs> then there was the post-quarantine conversation sketch where Elon played a convincing nerdy guy at party. Yep. Then we got a VW ID4 commercial. Again, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, then Elon played the producer in love with his cousin, who's the host of an Icelandic TV show called The Uli Show. A lot of cousin jokes in this episode <laughs> of SNL. 
a lot. Like, I think there were three skits with it in there. Weird. <laughs> Way too much. Elon made a brief appearance as the creepy guilty priest on Murder Durder. Murder Durder. Then he played Lloyd Ostertag, the cryptocurrency expert on the SNL news desk, where they kept asking him, but what is Dogecoin? And he finally had to admit that basically it was like a hustle. Right. Um, but he said that it was uh, to the moon. Dogecoin was rallying before SNL. It dropped about 10% during SNL. Interesting. During the course of about, uh, you know, a couple hours. But I mean, let's just think about it. He pitched it during the monologue and he pitched it during the news. It's Dogecoin. It's going to do whatever it wants to do. And it's been going down ever since. I think that it's, you know, I, I'm not. Maybe it was pre hype. I mean, maybe it was the fact that he tweeted out a lot of stuff about Dogecoin, like uh, the Doge father. Right. And I mean, Lloyd Ostertag said that he was the Doge father, but it was like one line. Right. And that was it. Um, I feel like maybe Elon wanted to do a little bit more, but they were like, no, let's make you not answer the question. It was weird. I think he's playing. I think this whole Dogecoin thing is a joke to him. And I think that it uh, started as a joke and it, it's still it, a joke. It's still a joke. I right. don't want. I mean, no, you know. I mean, it's not what we should base the world's currency on. <laughs> uh, Elon went on to play Wario, the evil Mario in the courtroom sketch that didn't really go anywhere. But we did get to see Grimes play Princess Peach. And I think that she did a fantastic job. Uh, she really got the whole like. <laughs> Nintendo fans, I'm sure that was exciting. Then we actually ended kind of strong, I think, for SNL, because usually SNL dies after the news. Uh, but we got two more good, I thought, pieces. We got Elon playing himself in the SpaceX headquarters as Pete Davidson, as Brad on Mars, has to save the new colony. Um, and I was kind of hoping uh, for about 10 seconds there that Pete was going to bust into a rap song, but it didn't go there. And I was oh, I was like, oh, it would have been awesome. I still think that it was really funny. It was nice to have like a, a light sketch about Mars. You Usually everyone's so serious about like, you're going to have to go out into the radiation. And But isn't that what he did? In like movies and stuff. Yeah, but it, it was nice oh, yeah. to kind of uh, take the sting off of it because he's just like, <laughs> okay. yeah. Uh, and then finally, we got the Western Saloon Pearl River Gang sketch where Elon played Leron, a version of himself just set back in the 1800s. And he kind of admitted in a funny way through the skit that he was wrong about masks early in the pandemic, which I thought was kind of interesting that they brought that human aspect in as well um and he even got to bring up boring tunnels yeah we're um, gonna bore under the gang and sneak up behind him yeah I, I feel like elon accomplished everything that he could have hoped for with his appearance on snl he was funny he was self-deprecating um he was wearing all sorts of silly and funny costumes that they put him in and i think that he was endearing by sharing something that he had never publicly shared before i just think that a lot of uh you know News writers were ready to dig into him for mm -hmm. being weird and like, oh, weird. He's weird because he's a billionaire. Yeah. Oh, he's so weird. It's because he has a lot of money. And it's like, that's really not the reason. He's always kind of been that way. Yeah, no, he skirted the whole richest man in the world thing. I mean, he got to hype Dogecoin, which he wanted to do. He shared his vision about a sustainable future for the planet, his dreams for Mars. He even brought in the self-driving horses as a little joke mm -hmm. there. Uh, most of all, it was just fun to see him having a great time. Yeah, and I mean, I don't think there was too much to lose here. I mean, Tesla's doing fantastically, um, and it was great to have him on Saturday Night Live. I think that that's going to kickstart a lot of conversations, maybe but, even with you people. But, you know, a funny thing was, aside from the brief photo of a horse being supercharged, uh, there was no mention of Tesla. And, I mean, that's kind of weird to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there was one piece that I would have loved to have seen, it would have been the Cybertruck uh, worked into some kind of skit because, well, that leads us to our next story. Yeah, I mean, it seems like Elon took the Cybertruck with him while he was in New York City. Yeah, New Yorkers got to see the Cybertruck on display at Tesla's store on Washington Street in the meatpacking district of Manhattan. And they drove the prototype through Times Square. It looks really cool with all the lights reflecting off of that, you know, <laughs> flat body. Now, a lot of people were thinking, was this the new version of the Cybertruck? Pranay asked, Cybertruck's looking sick. Is this the finalized version in terms of exterior design? Any more changes planned before it heads off to production? Elon says, pretty much looks like this. I think that this is the prototype that we saw at the unveiling. Yeah, I agree. And Whole Mars Catalog made a really good point. Uh, he said, Ford advertising exec, we plan to spend $3 billion this year advertising our cars. Elon Musk, yeah, let's bring the Cybertruck with us to SNL, drive it around Manhattan a little bit Friday night. Elon? Yep. And so basically, as we're about to talk about, the big auto companies had to pay a lot of money to run some ads. Mm -hmm. Elon got to just drive a Cybertruck around and for free, get a lot of publicity. So let's talk about those ads. The first one that ran was Lucid Air, um, and it came right after the opening monologue. Yeah. 
I think that this was supposed to be like a shot across the bow of Tesla. And maybe some people could read it that way. It was nice to see an EV ad followed by an EV ad, because I think then the very next ad was the Ford Mach-E. Yeah, uh, this was the chandelier ad. Basically, the Mach-E has to beat a falling chandelier, which shows off its speed, which, again, really good that these marketing companies are coming up with ways to show the world what electric cars can do. This was one of the first ads where it wasn't just like, it's a car. It looks just like our old cars, but this one's electric. This one, they actually showed the power of electric. And I have to say... I was very impressed with this ad. I really liked this Mach-E ad. The Lucid ad was okay. It just, you know, luxury car, ooh, ooh, ooh. Not a lot of talking about the electric stuff. The next one that I really liked, VW ID4 ad. Yeah. Crazy to me. You're, I'm so used to just being like, come on down to Buck Honda, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Drive a car off the lot today, 0% APR financing. <laughs> so used to that, so nice to have like, a car commercial where they're talking about electric cars and they're actually talking about the electricness of them. Yeah, one of the talking points on this VW ID4 ad was uh, the mom reaches back to make sure that the child's asleep and she says he won't know a world before electric. Yeah. And they had the cool lighting in the car, which again shows you how futuristic it is. And yeah, they're showing off all the quiet aspects of the car didn't really show off to me the environmental aspects of the car. And again, all of these car companies seem to skirt what I would think mm. would be your biggest selling point. But again, I guess if you're VW, since you're selling diesel cars, you don't want to talk about that. I think that that's definitely part of it. But it was just, to me, so refreshing to see back to back to back EV ads. And I have to give Elon credit for this. He is 100% the reason that they ran all those ads. Yeah. They knew that like, they're like, okay, here we are in the meeting today. Uh, Davis, what do you think we should do? Well, we know that Elon is going to be on SNL as everyone knows. I know I'm yelling because we're on a Zoom call. I have a bad microphone. Anyway, hello? Okay, yeah. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, um, Elon is going to be on SNL. Uh, why don't we run an ad right then? Because all those people who like, you know, Teslas, they're going to really love the Armaki slash ID4. It felt like I was in a different world, like we yes. had entered a new era. Yes. And I hope that that is the trigger for it. Yes. The sad part to me. <laughs> is that, um, of course, the Ford Mach-E, through no fault of Fords, is going to be severely limited in terms of production because of the right. chip shortage. I think the same thing's going to be happening with the ID4. Tesla doesn't seem to be as affected by the chip shortage, nope. which is pretty nice. Well, because they didn't cancel anything. <laughs> right. Overall, I think that it was a rounding success for Elon. It was a home run. Yeah. I, I would say that it, it definitely couldn't have gone any better. I don't think, you know, yeah, you could have the jerks who would be like, oh, he's weird. Not really a fair comparison because he comes right out at the beginning and says, hey, I have Asperger's. And I think, again, that's really big of, of him. Really smart also to say, yeah, I'm a guy who relands rockets, so I am not your normal chill guy. <laughs> right. I thought that was huge. I, I think that that was really smart. It was kind of a good introduction to him. Shows that he's self-deprecating, that he has a sense of humor about himself. Because like, yeah, I don't think that we would see Jeff Bezos going on Saturday Night Live and making fun of himself. I just want to point out how important it is to work with professionals. When you have uh, the writers at Saturday Night Live, and I'm not saying they're always the best, but when they kind of craft your monologue and you get to bring in pieces that you want to bring in and then they help you craft it, you get a message that really resonates. The problem most of the time with Elon is he doesn't pre-script anything and he doesn't have a, a person helping him write or produce. And so you kind of, unless you really know him well and can follow his speech patterns, you miss a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And I think this could maybe show him that, yeah, again, going back to our PR thing, if you have someone who can help you script the message, it's not lying. It's getting the message you want out to the people. And I think it shows that it's nice to have a group of people who, you know, can tell the rest of the story. Um, you know, Elon, you know, I think definitely held out his own for the opening monologue. But then for the rest of the scripts, as all SNL, you know, scripts go, he was part of the story. Right. And I think that for, you know, different events, I'm not saying that he's ever done like a terrible job with like an unveiling or something like that. But it is kind of nice if he isn't the only one yes. who has to carry the whole yes, day. Exactly. That's a lot of pressure for anyone. Yeah. And if you notice uh, with any car company, it's usually not just one person 
person right. talking about the whole thing. They usually hand it off to a bunch of sure flunkies. I'm not saying that, the, that Tesla should necessarily do that, but to have someone else who can kind of uh, – take over for Elon no, I agree. Uh, to, to do a lot of the like explaining and, and yeah. some of the boring stuff, yep. then have Elon come out, hit something with a sledgehammer or exactly. whatever he's going to do. I agree. But gosh, I really wish that the Cybertruck was in there. I really thought that Pete Davidson would be in the back doing some rap video and it would have been hilarious to see them like driving around New York. That was my only wish that didn't make it into the show. Maybe next time. But, you know, Tesla Time News is sponsored by Cybertruck Owners Club. There you'll find a crowdsource reservation tracker that you can update and find your place in line. You can check out their website for Cybertruck news, discussions about everything that could have taken place on Saturday Night Live but didn't. And there's a community for Cybertruck enthusiasts and future owners. So moving from a very positive story on Elon to a very negative story. Uh, the Verge has been trying to make this story stick for weeks like this story at this point to me is an old story but hey if no one buys it the first time you run it why not just run it again so it sounds like the verge must have some pretty good ammo as they run a story that says tesla privately admits elon musk has been exaggerating about full self-driving so let's read the article, shall we? Uh, the article relies heavily on a memo which summarizes a 30-minute virtual meeting between Tesla's autonomous driving team and the California DMV back on March 9th. This memo was obtained via a FOIA request by the now infamous Tesla short Aaron Greenspan, who personally uh, attacked us and tried to dox us, by the way. Um, anyway, he reprinted on his plainsight.org website. Now, it does give us some interesting info that we kind of already knew. OK, so as of March 9th, Tesla had 824 vehicles on FSD beta or city street pilot program, which they're calling it. Uh, 753 were Tesla employees and 71 were non-employees. And that was kind of surprising to me. Mm -hmm. I thought there was more non-employees. Mm -hmm. Now, most of these cars were in California, but there were vehicles in 37 states and they had driven 153,000 miles using city streets. Now, soon thereafter, Tesla expanded the program to 1,600 vehicles. But here's the meat of it. The DMV asked CJ Moore, which is Tesla's autonomous engineer, they asked about Elon's messaging about level five capability by the end of the year. They basically wanted to know, OK, you're at level two now. Elon says you might get to level five by the end of the year. What's going on? And so CJ Moore answered that the ratio of driver interaction would need to be in the magnitude of one or two million miles per driver interaction to move into higher levels of automation. And Tesla indicated that Elon is extrapolating on the rates of improvement when speaking about level five capabilities. Tesla couldn't say if the rate of improvement would make it to level five by the end of the calendar year. So that's your privately admits Elon is exaggerating bombshell. Yeah, I mean, basically, the DMV was asking like, hey, uh, you, I've heard Elon talk about uh, full self-driving capability. Are these car are all Tesla cars full self-driving? Because that's the regulators. They have to ask boring questions like that. And Tesla has to respond. No, most Tesla cars on the road aren't driving themselves 100%, you know, with people falling asleep behind the wheel in the car, driving them to grandma's house. So The Verge said in an earnings call in January, Musk told investors that he was highly confident the car will be able to drive itself with reliability in excess of humans this year. This isn't the first time that Tesla's private communications with the DMV have contradicted Musk's public declarations about his company's autonomous capabilities. So I think we need to explain some basics about how the world works to Verge. Elon tweets things about how he feels his companies are progressing on things like rockets and tunnels and electric cars. The California Department of Motor Vehicles is a state government regulatory agency that Tesla needs to file permits with to do certain things like test the city streets pilot program. Yeah, the DMV is doing their job, making sure that Tesla is communicating what full self-driving can and cannot do to its drivers. And the DMV wants to know when Tesla goes from level two to level three and so on. And here's where I think a lot of the confusion lies. Exponential curves. It's tricky for most people to understand. Almost everything that Elon does follows an exponential curve. Plot his rockets. Exponential. Plot the Tesla revenue. Exponential. Plot full self-driving. Exponential. Seems really slow at first. And then one day rockets are landing themselves and, and cars are driving themselves. Yeah. And so it's easy for, I guess, The Verge to think like, well, you don't have full self-driving today, so how could you possibly have it by the end of the year? And maybe they won't. Maybe it'll just be closer to it. But this idea that uh, Elon is not telling the rest of the world what's going on or that he's exaggerating – where did that come out in this conversation with the DMV? It, again, it goes back to one of these FUD articles where there's a big hyped headline 
Uh, there's really no meat in the article, but you get to walk away with your headline like, <laughs> and let's face it, most people don't read articles in their entirety, usually because they're so awfully poorly <laughs> written yeah. that you just like, okay, and then blah, 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 yeah, whatever. Anyway, yeah, I, it was good that I read the headline. Uh, okay, I'll move on. So I guess Elon is a big liar. I mean, in the earnings call, one of the things they say at the beginning of the earnings call is these are forward-looking statements. Right. Uh, we're not promising you anything. This is an earnings call. Th that's how earnings calls work. They don't. You don't come out if you're the CEO of Ford and you go, here's what is exactly going to happen next quarter. Well, but I'll be honest. A lot of the reasons why other car companies don't say anything interesting in their earnings calls is because they don't want this kind of article written. So they don't say anything that you can hold them to. Well, and, and also because they're not working on any of this stuff true. at any rate of speed. They just have some... Somebody at a department and they go, hey, is, is, do we have a department that works on autonomous driving? And they go, oh, yes, don't worry. Of course we do. Oh, good. <laughs> so glad we have a department working on that. Meanwhile, in that department, they're, you know, playing foosball in the rec room or whatever. They're not actually, uh, you know, moving at the speed that Tesla is moving at. Right. So for the past couple weeks, China has been a buzz about Tesla having faulty brakes all due to one accident involving one Chinese driver who rear ended someone while speeding. The only reason it has persisted as a story is because the lady in the passenger seat has been, let's say, persistent. Uh, a few more videos have surfaced of Teslas involved in rear end collisions in China. Oh no. Yeah, so let's watch them now. Uh, I'm sorry, wait, uh, none of them hit the car in front of them. Right. In each of these cases in China, the Tesla stops, but not the rest of the traffic, not the rest of the cars. So maybe all of their brakes failed. OK, so wait, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, if in all these cases, Teslas are able to keep from rear ending the person in front of them, then this is showing how great their brakes are and maybe their automatic emergency braking systems. Uh, where's this story? But what are you talking about? It's the you don't remember the lady whose uh, dad rear-ended someone going uh, like forty miles an hour of the speed limit. Yeah, I do remember that story because that's all they talked about. But why aren't they talking about this? We've got actual footage, right? And uh, you know, look, I'm not trying to say that uh, this kind of thing is going to happen more often in China. There are pileups that happen all throughout the world. It's a common thing. You know, stop traffic. You don't realize it until it's too late. You, even if you do slam on the brakes, um, you might go sailing into the car in front of you. Right. I mean, Tesla does have uh, advanced warning features to let you know that cars are stopped in front of you. It has saved me a couple times. I'll tell you, I'm get, you know, getting yeah. onto Storo Drive no, in me Boston too. and stuff where mm -hmm. you have to like, oh, suddenly you have to get over three lanes. So I'm like, OK, can I get over? Beep, 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 beep. Oh, wow. I would have hit the car in front of me. Yep. I, I'd like to do a little PSA here if I could. Mm -hmm. I think everyone should go into their settings if you have a Tesla. Mm -hmm and put it into early warning. Yes. Uh, you have the choice as the driver and you can do early, medium, and late. Uh, why not early? Right. I, I mean, I'll be honest. You know, I might be driving past like a parked car on in the road and it'll beep at me. And I saw the car. I wasn't going to hit the car. It was really nice to be warned because, I mean, what if I wasn't paying attention? Yeah. And what if I would have clipped it or, or you know, sideswiped yeah, it? Yeah, because let me just tell you, if you're hearing that early warning all the time, I think you as a driver are a bad driver. Wow, okay. Well, good news is you won't have to keep driving for much longer. So Lion Electric, which just completed its SPAC and is now listed on the New York Stock Exchange and the TSX Exchange as LEV, also announced some big news last week. So Lion is building a 900,000 square foot electric truck factory in Joliet, Illinois, which according to Lion will be the largest all electric medium and heavy duty vehicle plant in the U.S. Now, the first trucks are expected to roll out of the factory in the second half of 2022. Now, it's interesting to note that so far, Lion has delivered just about 400 buses and trucks in its first 10 years of operation. So this plant, which will be capable of producing up to 20,000 trucks and buses per year, is a major move forward for Lion. Lion says the plant will be adding at least 745 new clean energy jobs. And yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, it's kind of easy to forget. This company has kind of been hand manufacturing and delivering trucks mm -hmm. up until now. And now this factory is going to, I think, start going into overdrive. I'm really excited about it. You know, people have been very excited about Lion for a long time. I've always had to kind of temper my uh, resolve just because it was like, yeah, 
They're great. They're making these buses, but they aren't making them in vast numbers. Again, this factory is going to change that. And this is a supply and demand thing. This is showing us that we've hit the part of the curve, the inflection point, I think, where we've tipped it because they would not be building a factory if they didn't feel they had the demand. And right. so, you know, up to this point, you could have been like, well, why can't they make more? Maybe it's because they didn't have enough orders. Now, I think their sales department is like, uh, can we build them faster? And that demand helps drive financing, yep. which is like, how do you build a giant factory? Oh, that costs a lot of money. Yeah, you need good financing. How are you going to get good financing? You need investors. And how are investors going to know to finance? Good demand. So when you hear about like a municipality that's buying two buses and you're like, oh, two buses, whatever, that's just the beginning, right? Yep. They're probably going to want to buy more buses after they do their little tests. And the more municipalities that you hear about that are buying these buses and trucks, the more demand there is and Lion can start producing more. And I think we've had four years of pent up demand because of the last uh, federal administration. Yeah. So there was another Chevy Bolt fire on May 1st that not only destroyed the car, but also much of the owner's house. The owner of this 2019 Chevy Bolt had charged his Bolt in his garage to 75% state of charge and then unplugged it. So this fire appears to have started in the middle of the day while the whole family was at home. Now, luckily, everyone got out unharmed, but they suffered hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage and the family won't be able to return home for at least six months. This Bolt was bought brand new and only had 19,000 miles on it. It had not been driven that morning and it had been unplugged for several hours when the fire started. Now, GM told Electrek that four of the six Bolt fires that happened last year had started after the owners had driven the battery down low and then charged up high. So GM's temporary fix had been a software fix to only allow the batteries to charge to 95% state of charge. The owner of this Bolt had already done that fix and had gotten the recall notice in the mail that morning. And I just want to talk about what if this had not been a Bolt, but had been a Tesla instead? I mean, we had to kind of scour the news sources mm -hmm. to get you the story. If this had been a Tesla, I got to believe it would have been national news. And this is just such a bummer for me because I like Bolt owners, right? They chose to drive electric. Bolts, just by the fact that like GM doesn't have very good marketing um, on the Bolt and that the dealers don't know what to do with it. They're just trying to get them off their lots. Really good deals on Bolts. This sucks for Bolt owners because yep. now you're worried that you have a firebomb sitting in your garage um, where your garage is sometimes the only place that you can charge something. So, so now you're going to have to what? Go get an extension cord. What if you put in a level two charger? I'm really worried about this data point because up until this point, I was hopeful too that basically maybe if you just limited the batteries charging that you could solve this problem. If this is true, if this owner really had done what he said, and I think he did, then why did this battery catch on fire? Uh, and this to me is just like, you know, GM, you sub this out. You subbed out this whole uh, powertrain basically yep. from battery to motor to tire practically. And this is what you get for you didn't do your due diligence and it's not like you know this guy was at the drag strip right. it's not like he was you know racing the car or was going on the highway going way too fast and crashed into something no he had it parked in his house he had put 19,000 miles on it this guy was not some crazy driver and it gives all EVs a bad name now because you know when this story does make it to the average person they're just going to think EVs bad right and it's, I mean, it's really unfortunate. And also this fix that they did, you know, this like, oh, we'll reduce the range fix. Really not cool, no, first of all. I think if you're a Bolt owner, you should get, you know, a lawsuit going, a class action lawsuit and say, look, we don't want you to just fix it with software. We want a new battery pack. Right. Now, I know that basically the recall, there's two recalls. The first recall is to bring it in, nerf your battery pack to say, oh, you can't charge high, which already sucks. Then the next one is uh, they take in your car, do something to it to look at the battery um, and then decide whether or not the battery needs replacing. Or not. My guess is that there's a certain batch of parts. I don't know if it's the battery or some other part Maybe like the BMS, BMS yeah. that they know is bad or could be bad and that they're having to check it. And it probably takes a long time to, you know, hours in the shop to check it. But like GM, speed that up. This is an example of why you cannot leave those cars out there. But for Bolt owners, are you really going to trust GM that they did their due diligence, that they didn't just like, oh, you know, here's what we do at the GM shop. We take it in. We wait two days. We hold it for two days and then we give it back to them. OK, there's your car, Mr. Whatever. We didn't have to do nothing to it. 
That yeah. to me, it just I wouldn't trust GM to do that. No, because also GM is doing a calculation. I'm sorry to tell you, they're going, oh, this oh, cost a few hundred thousand dollars. dollars. Um, well, let's do the math. Right. All right, well, right. we'll, we'll just pay it out when it happens. Right. So I really do think that a class action lawsuit is needed here. I think that uh, I don't know, maybe all the bolts should get their batteries replaced because yeah. how can you trust? Uh, that the batteries aren't going to catch on fire. It yeah. would be one thing if they're like, oh, these people who had the battery fires, they were charging the batteries to full and then they were doing illegal stuff with it. They were charging their whole houses off of it and they would pulled off, you know, access panels and were, you know, connecting to battery terminals. That is not what is happening here. Yeah. So to me, it's like if I'm the average bolt owner, I'm worried. Now yeah. I have to, what am I going to do? Like either fireproof my garage? Am I going to have to, you know, leave my bolt out sitting in the rain every single day? It's, it's not cool. I do think that there should be some kind of lawsuit to sort this out. So it seems like we've been running the story a lot recently, but here it goes again. Tesla has raised prices for the fourth time in two months. Tesla Model 3 Standard Range Plus went from 38,990 to 39,490. For some perspective, this variant had cost $37,000 in February. Now it's up almost $2,500. The Tesla Model 3 Long Range All Wheel Drive, the price went from $47,990 to $48,490. This variant had been $46,490 in March, now up $2,000. The Model 3 performance price has stayed the same at $56,990. The Model Y Long Range All Wheel Drive price went from $50,990 to $51,490. And the Model Y performance stayed the same at $60,990. Now, we have been conjecturing that these price increases were because of the likely upcoming tax rebate being reinstituted by the federal government, but maybe this is just because of the increased demand Tesla is seeing. According to Electrek, Tesla has already sold out of all four models, that's S3, X, and Y, through the end of Q2, and we see that reflected in the estimated delivery times on Tesla's website. Yeah, I mean, demand is through the roof. It's all kind of hitting now, if you think about it. The refresh S and X, people were waiting and waiting and waiting for it. That's now hitting. Mm -hmm. The Y, the word has finally gotten out, and people are seeing it driving down the streets and yeah. like, oh, wait, they have an SUV now? Exactly. So, yeah, this is, uh, I think, everything's firing now. And I think that a lot of people who are like waiting for the Model S refresh, you know, either took a look at it and were like, I don't want that weird steering wheel, or they're going, I can't actually afford that, and they're going to buy that Model 3. Yep. So Neo just announced that they are launching into Norway. So first, let's talk about the cars. Neo will first launch the ES8 all-electric SUV, followed by the new ET7 sedan next year. Next to the stores, Neo will open a Neo house. Now, a Neo house has a showroom, a coffee shop, a daycare center, a library, a meeting room, and social spaces. So this is a big building. Mm -hmm. um, and in, that'll be open in Q3 in the center of Oslo. In 2022, Neo will open four spaces, which are much smaller. They're typically less than 200 square meters or 2,100 square feet. And those will be opened in Bergen, Stavanger, Trondheim, and Christensen. Next, the service centers. Uh, Neo's first Norway service and delivery center will be open in Oslo in September. Next, Neo will expand and offer mobile service and car pickup and delivery services. Lastly, charging, Neo is bringing four of its battery swap stations, called Neo Power Swap Stations, to Norway by the end of this year. And by the end of next year, they should have enough power swap stations to connect five major cities and freeways. And if you live in Norway, and you see someone with a Neo or you have a Neo, please send us video about it. We've not really been able to get over the Great Firewall of China uh, to hear much about uh, these cars. So I would love to hear how the battery swaps go and so forth. So according to Electric, Tesla has given away $23 million worth of free supercharger miles last quarter alone under the Tesla referral program. And now Tesla wants to change the program, eliminating the Tesla referral link in favor of an in-app exchange. So here's how it would supposedly work. You have your friend download the Tesla app. You share a link to them that will reward both of you and your friend once your friend goes for a test drive and orders a car. So what do you think? Is this a good idea? I think that this is a good idea. I think that the Tesla referral program was really necessary at the beginning of Tesla in general. It encouraged kind of that butts and seats thing. Today... Tesla is starting to become a little bit more mainstream. I think that uh, a lot of these uh, referrals are going to happen 
uh, whether there's an incentive to do it or not. And I think that also Tesla didn't fully understand how the influencer market would work. And I think that we're a perfect example of that. We took our referral links off of our site just because we, we weren't going to get any more benefit of it. I still have like 100,000 uh, free supercharger miles and I appreciate having them, but like totally don't need them. That that doesn't influence me to do this show at every week or anything like that. But people are always looking for codes because it does get them that little bit of thing. The one part that I will say is that the referral program kind of creates this like mushy, happy feeling where people feel like they're getting something when they order their car. Yep. I think that that's important. But again, if as long as they're not totally getting rid of the entire program, I think that it'll work out fine. Now, I'd like to point out that on paper, Tesla may have given away $23 million in free supercharging, but I would bet that a lot of that free supercharging never gets used because, A, many people don't realize it only lasts six months, and now it was extended during the lockdown, but, you know, six months isn't that long, and B, many people never end up supercharging as much as they think they would, especially in that short amount of time, um, because usually you charge at home. And this supercharging is worth about $112 per 1,000 miles that they give away, so it's not a huge deal, but I think it just sounds really good. It's like, and you get a thousand supercharger miles. Right. And I think that that's a great introduction to supercharging. It puts people at ease that it's like, oh, I'm not going to get, you know, screwed at the supercharger because, you know, a lot of people don't know how much it's going to actually cost. Um, it is nice that, uh, you know, Tesla offers this. And then once you're kind of used to it and then you're like, oh, it only costs me like 10 bucks to fully charge my car, which is way cheaper than gas. That's awesome. Well, that's a really good point. I think a lot of people, if they didn't get these free supercharger miles, would probably never supercharge or right. not much. And so now that they go try it because it's free, mm. they then realize the, the benefit of this network and they tell their friends about it. All right, it's time for Going Green, brought to you by EcoWare. And uh, we now plant 10 trees for every order, which I think is really cool. So please send in your photos with you and your EcoWare. And if we use a photo of you, you could win a free EcoWare gift card. And on top of the 10 trees that we plant, we also carbon offset the manufacturing, the shipping, and the life cycle of your purchase. We plant the 10 trees on top of that. And we also help cap a well for every order so we can stop these holes in the grounds from spewing methane up into the atmosphere. So you know that we love e-bikes on this channel. We have a whole other YouTube channel called Now Let's Review where we've reviewed a ton of e-bikes. We just posted a new review of the Hyper Scorpion by Juiced Bikes, which I think might be my favorite e-bike so far. Yeah, the Hyper Scorpion is a lot of fun. It has a huge range, up to 70 miles. It has both front and rear suspension and a moped style seat. So it's really super comfy to ride, which I also love. It is this big headlight that's easy to see, and it even has turn signals. And it comes with these left and right rear view mirrors, which now I kind of can't live without. I love being able to see the traffic behind me. And if you want, you can go super fast, up to 30 miles an hour in race mode. And it has torque and cadence sensing, which I know a lot of people watch are like, what does that mean? But it just means that when you pedal, the motor gives you a very smooth power. So it's not that jerky like on, off that you get with a lot of other e-bikes. Right now, the price is $26.99 and you can get $50 off by using our link in the show notes below and the code WELCOME50. Yeah, Juice Bikes is based in San Diego, California, and they have great customer service. Um, they can barely keep up with demand right now. I believe the model that we reviewed, the Hyper Scorpion, will be coming back into stock at the end of this month. And I've been finding myself taking this bike out for almost all of our daily rides now, uh, pretty much exclusively. And it's because I like it so much. It has the power when you need it. You can just twist the throttle and get through a tricky intersection real fast. But also what I love is that when we are riding slowly through like a nice quiet road, you can turn it down to say eco mode and pedal slowly and the bike goes slow without any of the jerkiness. It's just a nice smooth ride. So for more information and our whole review, our e-mobility expert Ethan did a fantastic review over on our Now Let's Review channel. The link is down below. Go check it out. So remember that lady who said F Elon Musk last year? Wait, that was last year? Yeah, that was California Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez. And she has just backed an amended bill, AB1139, which would gut the state's solar roof program and screw over anyone with solar in the state of California. Wait, what? 
Yeah, so her bill would make going solar more expensive for every rate payer, including non-residential consumers like schools and farms, including those on care rates or living in multifamily affordable housing. It would eliminate 20-year grandfathering for 1.0 and 2.0 customers, including schools and farms. It would introduce new grid access monthly charge, which would add 50 to $86 per month for the typical residential solar use. Charge would be higher for larger non-residential systems. And the bill hurts low-income and at-risk communities the most and does nothing to create equity or diversity in the market. Quite the opposite. It moves California backwards. Why is she doing this? Well, this Democrat assemblywoman uh, is doing what PG&E wants. I'm sorry, PG&E? Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. That is California's, by and large, uh, you know, energy grid. She is doing exactly to the letter what PG&E wants. Um, PG&E has been hurting, uh, mostly because of their poor handling of the California wildfires and because people now have solar and are making their own power and they want money and they haven't been able to extract the money from these ratepayers the way that they wanted. So now they wanna change the law. They wanna take something where people were grandfathered in to a certain rate of electricity because that's how they were going to afford to put solar on their roofs mm -hmm. because that's how you do a calculation over time. You say, right. oh, well, if that's the rate that I can pay, I could save money by putting solar on my roof, which is exactly the point of why those laws were put into place in the first place. And now they want to go back on them. This not only like hurts people who now want to go solar, it hurts people who already have solar on their roofs right now. So I want you to go kill this bill and i want you to vote out lorena gonzalez because she does not deserve to be in the office yeah down on the show notes below you will find a link this is where you can basically just send a message off straight to your representative so yeah call your representatives let them know that this bill ab1139 should never pass and should never see the light of day again wow and if you want to tell more people about this we have a clips channel where we cut these news stories into bite-sized clips that you can share easily so head on over to the now you know clips channel and share this especially if you have any friends that live in California. So TechCrunch's Mark Harris seems to have uncovered a little tidbit, a little morsel regarding Tesla's battery day. If you remember back to battery day, Drew Baglino, Tesla's VP of engineering, and Elon spent a couple slides talking about how inefficient the current technology is when it comes to traditional cathode process. And they showed this slide. Yeah, you have to take metal from the mine, add acids and water and then stuff happens and then you get a bit of cathode and a whole bunch of wastewater. Now I'm paraphrasing here, but basically about 4,000 gallons of wastewater for every ton of cathode material made. Drew and Elon said that Tesla has a way of recirculating the water. They said, as you can see, a whole lot less is going on here. We get rid of the intermediate metal, water, final product, cathode, recirculate the water, no wastewater at all. And when you summarize all of that, it's a 66% reduction in CapEx investment, a 76% reduction in process costs and zero wastewater, much more scalable solution. So what Harris has uncovered is that it appears that just two weeks before battery day, Tesla acquired a patent application from Spring Power International, a small company based outside of Toronto, Canada, for three dollars. Now, it could be that Tesla bought more than the patent because uh, Spring Power's website was replaced by a single holding page just one week before battery day. And now three of its employees, including CEO Michael Wang, appear, according to their LinkedIn pages, to work for Tesla. The three patents that Tesla bought for $3 appear here in Appendix A. Innovative process to produce cathode materials for rechargeable lithium ion batteries and process for recovering spent materials in rechargeable lithium ion batteries and method to produce cathode materials for lithium ion batteries. Now the other Spring Power employees, Yang Lu is now a senior research engineer at Tesla and Amrit Bogan is now a cell engineering technician at Tesla. And remember, Tesla has done this before. They acquired Highbar, which is a Canadian firm and a lot of other smaller firms when they need their technology. And so this $3, I think, is because we haven't seen the whole picture yet. This is probably just a piece of it. I don't think they were like, can we buy that for $3? I think uh, this was part of a deal where it's like, hey, do you want to come work for Tesla? Or, you know, we'll pay you money to acquire the whole company. 
because that company appears to be gone. So Ford announced their e-transit vans last year. We learned about the 198 kilowatt or 266 horsepower motor, the 67 kilowatt hour usable battery, the 126 mile range, and the 115 kilowatts of fast charging. And we learned all about the different configurations, but we didn't learn about the pricing until now. Yeah, Ford announced that the starting MSRP price will be $43,295 for the cutaway or box truck. And then on the high end, $52,690 for the high roof extended wheelbase cargo van. Now, Ford has a website for you to register your interest, and these vans will be going into production next year with no hard date yet on deliveries. But I want to talk about the price. Yeah, if you are a service company and you need a van to do your work, electricians, plumbers, contractors, uh, I think this is about what you're expecting to pay for a van. Right. Now, I know that a lot of people might say like 126 miles of range. Second, Jesse, that's not enough range. In some cases, I'm sure that it's totally not enough range. But I think for like your local plumber and stuff where like you might only need to drive a couple towns over, it's probably more than enough range that you need. As long as you have some place to charge it, you should be all set. And let's face it, most uh, people either, you know, charge at their house or they have, you know, an office. Um just install a charger and you're, you're probably all set because, uh, you know, 67 kilowatt hour battery will definitely charge up overnight no matter how you're feeding it. Yeah, maybe you can give a discount uh, to your clients if you can charge at their house while you're doing work on their plumbing. It's like, uh, <laughs> hey, I'm going to fix your toilet while I'm doing it. Can I just plug in uh, in your garage? That's true. I'll give you 10% off. <laughs> right. Um, you probably wouldn't give the 10% off, let's be honest. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that at that price point, it could definitely make a lot of financial sense for some people, um, especially if you factor in the gas and the maintenance. So you remember the Citroen Ami? Yes, I like this little electric car. It costs about $6,000 and has a 5.5 kilowatt hour battery pack for a range of 44 miles or 70 kilometers. It has a six kilowatt motor and a top speed of 28 miles an hour. That's 45 kilometers an hour. And I think this falls under the NEV standard or the Neighborhood Electric Vehicle Standard here in the US, allowing it to drive on local roads with 35 mile an hour speed limits. Funny that you mentioned local roads because it's coming to the US. All right, well, let's buy one. Well, you, you can't buy it. You just said it's coming to the US. Yeah, as part of Stellantis's, because remember, let's do a little backstory here, folks. I remember Stellantis is the new name of uh, the PSA group that merged with FCA. OK, you got all that? No, you don't. Uh, basically, a whole bunch of companies had to merge because they would have gone out of business. It's Stellantis. We're all familiar with Stellantis. It's, Stellantis. it's been around for weeks. <laughs> anyway, this is part of their new subscription service called Free to Move. OK, so it's a ride sharing app service. Yes. So they had a soft launch in Washington, D.C. and Portland. Soft launch basically means we tried it uh, and they say they're now expanding to more American cities. So please help us by finding an Ami when it comes to your area and filming it for the show. Um, but I had a question for you. Uh, see this marketing photo of the Ami? Uh huh. Uh, remember a while back we had one of our viewers do a really good. Um, he drove around the Ami in, mm -hmm. in France um, and it's a small car, right? Yeah, it's tiny. Well, look at this picture. Well, <laughs> you don't maybe know this, but those two people, famous small actors. What? Yeah, they're just, they're 100% perfectly proportioned. They're just small. That's not true. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think they had to find actors who were just small. They're going to be in high demand for small cars. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Dave. I'm a small actor. I'm, uh, I'm five foot. Exactly. Uh, I look like... I'm probably like 5'11", uh, but I'm actually five foot tall. I'm perfectly proportioned. Uh, you know, I have a lot of, uh, I do a lot of work with, you know, hamburgers. I have small hands too, so it just makes everything look bigger. Because, I mean, look at the headroom. There's no way that car has that headroom. It, look, and it doesn't matter. I love the Ami. <laughs> Uh, it was designed to maybe be affordable. Maybe it does. Like, maybe I'm wrong. Like, I, that's, we have to get in one. We have to get in one. Yeah. And we haven't seen an American get in one. Uh, right. I just want to say. <laughs> All right, well, check this out, Jesse. Franz von Holzhausen, Tesla's chief designer, took a three-wheeled Arkimoto for a spin last week with his sons tweeting out, Fun times with boys test driving Arkimoto. So remember that according to Arkimoto CEO Mark Fronmeyer, Elon Musk crashed an Arkimoto when he, quote, jumped into the driver's seat of a Deo's Arkimoto and promptly drove it into a brick wall. Now, that's uh, Silicon Valley investor Adeo Resi. I could ask you a question here. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, why is Franz driving an Arkhamoto? Is he checking it out? Could they be interested in buying the company? I don't know. I think that Franz probably likes electric vehicles just like I do. And given the chance to drive anything that has an electric motor on it, uh, it's going to jump at the chance. Um, good on you for not driving it into a brick wall. <laughs> Um, maybe Elon was driving into a brick wall to, to you know, curb, test the safety curb the competition, you know. <laughs> Wait, so this is your only prototype? So did I read that headline right? German newspaper urges readers to short Tesla? Yes. Uh, German newspaper Frankfurter Algemeen published an article by the business editor Daniel Marr in which he said that basically Tesla should not be worth more than Daimler. So let's short Tesla. Uh, he writes, and this is Google translated, so I'm sorry, uh, but are the markets mistaken? Why should a sevenfold market value for Tesla be justified with only a tenth of the profit? Yes, the future is traded on the stock exchange, but Daimler has just presented a very fancy electric car. Who says that only Tesla will make real money with electric cars? Are the markets just too stupid? Only by joining forces can it finally succeed in bringing the magician of the markets, who Elon Musk undoubtedly still is, to his knees. If the Tesla share price breaks, and that's what we expect, by 10%, our turbo short gains 50%. At 20%, it's already 100. And if Tesla even slips to the pathetic Daimler level, our secret weapon wins 427%. Wait, so what is he talking about? A super short? Yeah, uh, he's basically saying that you can short Tesla. So he's trying to do what all the other shorts have been trying uh -huh. for years uh, because he thinks it's overvalued. He thinks, hey, Daimler is this amazing car company. How can Tesla be worth more and than it? And Daimler just came out with a fancy electric car. Yeah. Which Define, <laughs> come out with, because uh, I haven't seen one on the road yet. And also, you know, sure, it's fancy. Yeah. Let's call it unaffordable. Um, you know, the, the very big difference between the EQS or whatever and uh, Tesla Model 3 in terms of price. Um, maybe it's not as fancy, but I think that more people are going to buy a Model 3 than they're ever going to buy an EQS. Moore does warn his readers that they can lose everything if Tesla stock goes up just 20 percent. But he says that Tesla stock doesn't have momentum and believes it should crash. Oh, right. Because of that. A bad court no um because of the uh, no demand no um because the um because elon no because um, the tesla killer's coming jesse oh, i'm sorry i forgot that one yeah such an old <laughs> argument the tesla killers are coming look at this unattainable car all right eli is here again with us for the starman report spacex has just successfully landed their starship prototype sn15 starship heading back to the lander zone The landing was nearly flawless, but SpaceX now has a new problem. So now that SpaceX has successfully landed SN15, they have a new problem to solve, and that's how do they get it off the launch pad? Even Elon didn't expect that they would actually land a booster until about SN20, and at the time of landing SN15, they had not yet figured out how they would get it off the pad. Succeeding earlier than you planned, of course, is a great problem to have, and no doubt they will figure out how to get the rocket off. It would be pretty ironic, though, that if after a successful landing, they went ahead and demoed the booster anyway, just to clear off the path. <laughs> A notable follow-up to the launch was the story by Atlantic. Elon Musk is maybe, actually strangely, going to do this Mars thing. And it's really great to see more mainstream outlets waking up to what all of us here watching know, and that is that Mars is really going to happen. In other space news, you may have heard about the Chinese rocket booster that's gonna make an uncontrolled crash back down to Earth. And while this may sound like the plot of a Bruce Willis movie, it's actually true. What happened is during the launch of the Chinese Long March 5B rocket, it was flying faster than expected. So instead of the main booster crashing back down to Earth, it went out into low Earth orbit. So what this means is there is a core stage of the rocket, which is about 98 feet tall, 16 feet wide, and it's spinning out of control orbiting the Earth, and any day it's gonna re-enter Earth's atmosphere. There are two things that make this significant. It's the largest man-made object to ever perform an uncontrolled re-entry, and it has the potential to hit an occupied area. So this image here shows the possible impact zone for the booster upon re-entry. There is a large amount of unoccupied land and ocean in this zone, but there is also some major cities, which is causing some people concern. The statistical probability is that it won't land on anyone's home and no one will be harmed, but it does seem a bit scary because scientists don't actually know where it's going to land yet. 
And you're probably wondering, how is that even possible? Well, it's because this is an uncontrolled re-entry, and we can only be roughly accurate when this object will succumb to Earth's gravity and make its final re-entry. The benefit of controlled re-entry is that we use thrust to guide the rocket, we choose the entry point, and we know exactly where it's gonna crash down, but this tumbling hunk of metal, we just have to wait for physics to run its course. Could we shoot it out of orbit? Yes, we have the technology, we could set up a missile and blow it up, but that would likely only cause more devastation as it could destroy countless number of satellites in orbit and even put the lives of the astronauts on the ISS in jeopardy. Thank you so much for watching this segment of the Starman Report and back to you, Zach and Jesse. Oh crap. Uh, so sh I'll go outside and, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just check to make sure it's not coming down. No, no, it already crashed. Yeah, it crashed into the ocean because uh, Keep in mind the surface area of the Earth, mostly ocean. What's up, China? You've done this before. This is the second time with this rocket that you've done this. Uh, can you stop doing that? Yeah, whatever. You put, whatever. <laughs> you put stuff up, comes back. It hit the ocean. Nobody got hurt. This time. Yeah. What, what, are, what are the chances? Anyway, uh, thank you, Eli. If you want to check out his channel, The Starman Report, for more great space news, and you can get Starman suits and the adventures of Starman graphic novels at starmangifts.com. All right, it's time for Into the Future. London-based Arrival, which SPACed recently under CIIC, will list on NASDAQ soon as ARVL. And they have announced a partnership with Uber to make an EV for rideshare drivers. The Arrival car is expected to start production in Q3 of 2023. Arrival is asking Uber drivers to help give uh, feedback, although it appears they already have some preliminary designs. You can see that they've removed the front passenger seat and replaced it with like a box or a footstool. Now, doesn't this look a lot like the interior? of a Model 3? And like, why ask Uber drivers for help if you've pretty much already designed it? And then what about autonomy? Yeah, um, no mention of autonomy. It seems to all be about Uber drivers. And I think that's where they're totally missing the mark here. I mean, because they have talked about how their other vehicles, their buses and uh, mini buses are going to have autonomy. Why wouldn't you want your robo taxis to have autonomy? You don't want to tell the Uber drivers that. I, my guess. Is it seat stealthily driver, built in? Like, driver's seat, actually an ejector seat. <laughs> as soon as they turn on the network, <laughs> you're out. Yes, but uh, these have steering wheels and they don't have a front passenger seat. So you just thrown away like a quarter of the passenger space. It and, could be retrofitted, you know, whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Um, the other question here is that I think that Arrival is planning to build these in their micro factories. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. Do you think that the micro factory model and this new Uber vehicle is the way to go? Uh, please let us know. All right, it's time for Sunspots. <laughs> So let's talk about solar jobs here. Here in the U.S., because of the pandemic, we saw the number of solar jobs fall 6.7% last year, but still almost a quarter of a million Americans had solar jobs. The Solar Energy Industries Association just released the National Solar Jobs Census 2020 report, and it showed that to meet President Biden's 2035 clean energy targets, the U.S. will need more than 900,000 workers. Now, these are good paying jobs, in most cases paying more than the national average for jobs like electrical engineers, electricians, maintenance workers, and construction managers. And speaking of solar jobs, NL Green Power North America, headquartered right here in Massachusetts, just announced it has started construction of five new wind, solar, and battery storage projects here in the U.S. That's over 300 megawatt hours of battery storage and 4.1 terawatt hours of generation per year. Yeah, that's powering more than 525,000 households a year and creating more than 1,500 construction jobs. And if you're thinking of getting solar on your house but you got lots of questions, contact our friends at EnergyPal. They are the solar and battery experts that help homeowners go solar for less. Their link is down in the show notes below. Time now for our video contributor story. We got Trevor with a story about his father's Toyota Tacoma recall. Hey, Zach and Jesse. This is my father's uh, Toyota 2006 Toyota Tacoma. And we know how much um, Tesla gets blown out of proportion when anything goes wrong with their vehicles. Um, I'm wondering who's heard about this. This was a recall for Toyota for 2006 to 2014 Toyota Tacoma extended cabs. Um, just replacing a, you know, a, a mild thing on the truck. The frame seems like a big item. Just wondering if uh, this hit the mainstream. My dad was saying that about one in three, he guesses, is probably 
uh, the number that had to be done and uh, some were coated, the newer ones were coated. His is a 2006, so it had more damage than, um, like rust damage than maybe a 2014 would have. So about one in three just got the frame coated. His got changed out. It took two technicians working five straight days um, to take this body and this, well, I guess stripping it down, whatever they had to do, to get the frame separated and put a new frame on this vehicle um, under warranty because it was a recall. Now you know. Yeah, so it turns out the Toyota paid $3.4 billion in class action lawsuits over rusty truck frames. That's a total of 1.5 million Toyota Tacomas, Tundras, and Sequoias. The settlement allowed Toyota not to have to admit any wrongdoing. Uh, funny thing is, this wasn't the first time Toyota trucks had frame rust problems. Yeah, Toyota had to fix many 1995 through 2000 Tacomas, 800,000 trucks. And then Toyota recalled 2001 through 2003 Tundras for frame rust. Oh, and the 2005 through 2011 Tacomas were recalled for leaf springs that could rust and break. If only you could make a truck out of some kind of metal that does is strong, but it doesn't rust. No, there's no such metal. Dang Sorry. it. All right, it's time for the Patreon bonus stories. And uh, we're going to talk about a guy that you should arrest and Elon's salary. So check it out on patreon.com slash now you know. And for only a buck a month, you get to see all of our stories. All right, we are back from the Patreon bonus stories. It's time for the shout outs. And these are our Patreons who support us for $5 or more a month. And it's a super huge help that makes it possible for us to do what we do. Who do we have, Jess? Andreas S. Tico Trigo. John Butler. David McGinn. Bill Lennon. Jonathan Turner. One Bit Squared. Cuba Walensky. Lucifer. Martin Formanek. Adam. Isaac Alvarez. Donald Chambers. Patrick T. James Habenton. Johan Israelson. Jeff Heenley. Andrew Horowitz, Diraj Makija, and Daniel Jacobson. Thank you so much for supporting us. We can't do this show without you. All right, it's time for Elon's Sweets of the Week. Uh, so first, Edward said, on tonight's rerun of SNL, VW ran an ID4 commercial. Will they run it next week? And of course they did. JPR007 says, making money from VW through Elon Musk. Irony man. And Elon said, ha ha. John Andrew Entwistle said, Elon should be more focused on Earth. Um... NASA simulated an asteroid, couldn't engineer a solution to avoid impact in the allotted time period. Elon said, one of many reasons why we need larger and more advanced rockets. Um, yeah, because uh, if a big asteroid hits the Earth, <laughs> we're done so. Yutsov said, Apple making a car? Show me making a car. LG making a car. Sony making a car. Huawei making a car. Tesla is already making cars. Everyone's going to make cars. Elon said, prototypes are easy, production is hard. Everything SpaceX tweeted out photos of the astronauts returning to Earth, all smiling. Elon said, so great to see the happy faces. Homar's catalog quoted Peter Rawlinson, the Lucid CEO, who said, we won't have level four or level five anytime soon. That's pure fantasy. Nobody will. And Waza said, smart Lucid investors will look at this and realize their CEO is actually way behind the bell curve in his understanding of the tech landscape. Last time I saw a Lucid video, Peter was talking about the tightness of some buttons on the Lucid dashboard. Who are you fooling? Louis Serrano said, Lucid has better tech than Tesla, period. Duh, 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 duh. And then Waza responded, said, OK, but please read the first three words of my tweet above. Luis went on to say, your opinion doesn't make anything true. And by the way, why would Elon make Lucid CEO chief engineer if he is how you say he is? Bashing Lucid CEO is also bashing Elon's past decision. Elon said Rawlinson was never chief engineer. He arrived after Model S prototype was made, left before things got tough, and was only ever responsible for body engineering, not powertrain, battery, software production, or design. Dis! Wow. Uh, SpaceX tweeted out this awesome May the 4th be with you uh, tweet. Is that legit? Is that a real picture? I I think it is. Michael Sheets said, news. SpaceX says it has received more than 500,000 orders for Starlink satellite internet to date, but the $99 deposits are fully refundable and do not guarantee service. Elon said, only limitation is high density of users in urban areas. Most likely, all the initial 500,000 will receive service. More of a challenge when we get into several million user range. So Tesla's head of autonomy, Andre Kaparthi, has figured it out. 
He figured out full self-driving? Uh, no, he figured out the formula for the Wall Street Journal front page. Here it is. Okay, and uh, all the coders out there are laughing hysterically, <laughs> and the rest of us are... <laughs> what? And of course, Elon knows code, so he's laughing his butt off. New scientists tweeted out the hydrogen atoms in your body, which account for a little over a tenth of your mass, were formed in the Big Bang. Elon says, which means about one tenth of you is 13.8 billion years old. I'm surprised he didn't go with a yo mama joke. That explains a lot about how I feel today. <laughs> David Sachs says, if you want to change the world, don't just create a startup, create a movement. And Elon said, the movement. And then he posted this great uh, Nathan for you. You have to episode. watch this. It's so awesome. Just, yeah, after the show, go watch it. It's hilarious. Elon Musk said, I love Art Deco. Aaron Gamely said, I mix steampunk and Art Deco. And Elon said, I had a steampunk Japan birthday party once. I wonder which birthday that was, you know. <laughs> Michael Baylor said iterative development is the SpaceX way. And then he went through SN8, SN9, SN10, SN11, all blew up SN15. Elon said, only way to create rapidly and fully reusable orbital rockets, the fundamental technology revolution needed to make life multiplanetary. And Jim Farley said, congratulations to the SpaceX team for this amazing accomplishment. Elon said, thanks, Jim. So that was the CEO of Ford congratulating Elon. Nice. Good job. John Krause said SpaceX was founded on this day in 2002, 19 years ago. Where might they be in 2040? Elon said, Mars Base Alpha. Yeah. Yeah. And Viv said, still aiming for a 2026 launch window? Elon says, 2024 is not out of the question for an uncrewed flight. Yes. Land a Cybertruck on Mars. Land a Cybertruck on Mars. David Spade said, I wonder if Elon on SNL will be a 90-minute infomercial for Dogecoin, buying it as we speak. And uh, he must have lost a lot of money. <laughs> and Elon <laughs> responded, laughy face. S. Padre tweeted out, driving away from SpaceX, Boca Chica, amazed and inspired, looking at SN15, standing like a champ. Elon said, nice shot. And then Money, Money, Money said, I've always felt that Dogecoin was in a way Elon's private stimulus for the people. Elon said, that is how I feel about it. Hmm, I didn't. A little strange. <laughs> okay. And Cosmic Perspective said, this is history. The first landed starship. We are so inspired by all the teams working to turn sci-fi into reality. Congrats to SpaceX and Elon Musk. Elon said, we'll use this as my wallpaper. And I, I think I will too. And then Elon tweeted out this meme, which is hilarious. And finally, uh, Elon said, first time a Falcon rocket booster will reach double digits in flight. And we're talking about the launch that just happened of 60 Starlink satellites from Launch Complex 40 in Florida. Wow. All right. It's time for the poll. We had asked a question. What was it this week? We said, uh, how do you think Elon did on SNL? 248 people said that he did great. Uh, 44 people said that there was at least one good sketch with him in it. Um, only seven people said that he did badly. Yeah, he did not do badly. He was perfect. Yeah, it was really good. I mean, first SNL. Yeah. All right, it's time for Community Mail Time. Community Mail Time. What is this? We've got answers to the universe. Let's see some Tesla features. Open garage door. Hmm, good to know. Now something more important. What is the purpose of life, universe, and everything? Hmm, now you know. <laughs> Our buddy John spotted this three row Model Y in Virginia. Take a look at that license plate. Nice. And our buddy Sean said the best way to charge your Tesla using only solar power built using VW Dieselgate blood money in your work's competitor's parking lot. Nice. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, I guess that is the best way to charge your EV. Hard to do that with a gas car. And then uh, Ralph got this amazing shot. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's Starlink. Uh, so that's a long exposure shot, which is why it was long. Oh. They don't look like elongated pieces of rice. Don't worry. Um, and then this meme slaps. Thank you to Steve. And for those of you who need a little bit more context, that's Gordon Johnson in the bottom. Oh, the Super famous Tesla short analyst guy. Uh, famous. Infamous. Stupid. <laughs> uh, loses a lot of money if you listen to his trades. So uh, be wary. And, and, and this is from uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, it's time for Supercharger Reviews, and these are sponsored by our friends at EvanX, the Tesla community's accessory store. If you're looking for awesome accessories for your Tesla, check out EvanX and use our discount code now, you know, to save $10 on purchases over 100 
Hey, Zach and Jesse, this is Dennis at the 12 stall, 350 amp supercharger station in Daytona Beach, Florida. As you can see, not many people here. It's in the Target parking lot with plenty of amenities nearby, including a Cracker Barrel across the street and across the International Speedway Boulevard is the Daytona Speedway. So easy peasy DC charging, including enough for my humble little bolt on charge point down the way. Now you know. Hi Zach and Jesse, this is uh, Bruce reporting from the one of the newer uh, level three um, chargers here in Draper, Utah. And you're talking to the third grade grandson of whom this town was uh, named after. It's got uh, a lot to do here. There's uh, a local favorite of Arctic Circle, lots of stores, um, great access to the freeway from here. Um, I'd give this a 10 out of 10. I love to have a level three supercharger. And uh, now you know. Hey, Zach and Jesse, my name is John Michael, and on this brisk morning, I am here in Ontario, Oregon, to check out the new 8-stall version 3 supercharger. It's located just off of Interstate 84 in Ontario, Oregon, next to the Idaho border and the Snake River. There are several strip malls here with various shopping needs and fast food restaurants, as well as dine-in restaurants, anchored by a Home Depot and a Walmart. Today in my 2018 Model X 100D, I was able to get 77 kilowatts with no battery preconditioning, although it is a brisk morning out. It was a little bit difficult to find off of the road, a little bit hidden in this parking lot, so I will give it an 8 out of 10, and down you know. I'm at the 16 stall Urban Supercharger in Marin City, California, just a few miles north of the Golden Gate Bridge. The superchargers are located prominently placed at the entrance to the Marin Gateway Center, a shopping center which has all sorts of facilities, including a CVS, a Subway, a West Marine, all kinds of things, and it's open on the weekends and on the weekdays as well. The center knows how to cater to the Tesla charging community as they have a menu and discover mechanism for scanning a code and finding out what is available here at the Marin Gateway Center. There is also a charge point charger here. I would rate this urban supercharger a 10 out of 10 for easy access and a great variety of services to use while you charge. Thank you so much for doing those awesome supercharger reviews. Keep them up. Um, we have a whole website where you can find the places on earth where no one has reviewed the superchargers or the destination chargers. I know, and we're a pretty cool space now because there's so many of them. Yes. So yeah, go fill in the ones, especially that don't have a video yet. All right, so for new superchargers this week, I want to point out that these are all version three, so we don't even have to mention that. And Tesla has reached 25,000 supercharger milestone, which is awesome. And here's an interesting tidbit. Uh, if you take the 1.6 million Teslas on the road, you divide that by the 25,000 supercharger stalls, you get about one supercharger stall for every 64 Tesla cars. Now, since we know that this ratio is working quite well, it'll be interesting as other auto manufacturers start making more EVs if those other charging companies will have a similar ratio of stalls to cars. I don't know if the ratio is that important. I think that it's more geography. And speed. And speed. Yeah. Uh, you can't just have them all in, clumped in one area. You need them spread out and you can't have them too spread out. You need them in some cases clumped up in one area. <laughs> So, All right, so what do we got this week? We've got number 91 in Germany is the 12 stall version 3 in Zeus Marshausen, Germany. Number 65 in Florida, the 8 stall in Crystal River, Florida. The 8 stall in Hamilton Township, southbound, New Jersey. Number 35 in New Jersey is the 8 stall in Flemington, New Jersey. Number 623 in Europe is the 12 stall in Air de la Vie, France. 
And number 1029 in the USA, number 2723 in the world is the 8th Stall in Monument, Colorado. All right, it's time for the giveaway. And to get to this big barrel of fun, you can join us on Patreon. The more you support us, the more you get in here. Uh, we're going to be giving away a $30 gift card to EcoWare. So who's our winner this week, Jess? The winner is Jacob Sibilski. Jacob, congratulations. You have won a $30 gift card to EcoWare where we design everything with solar energy. We completely carbon offset it. When you buy a tea, we plant 10 trees and we also cap a well. So it's a lot of stuff that we do. Um, uh, and thank you so much for everyone who has been uh, buying stuff off of EcoWare because it, it helps support this channel. And yeah, it's very, very carbon negative. You know what I'm feeling right now? Relief. What? I think I had been penting up all of this uh, stress about Saturday Night Live. Ah. And now, because Elon did a fantastic job and it was awesome and funny, I'm just like, ah. Because yeah. I was kind of afraid, I think, that we were going to go out into the world and people were going to be like, oh, you like that guy who <laughs> totally flopped? Right. But he didn't. Did a great job. So, yeah. Elon, awesome job. Congratulations, Elon. Give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, I think everyone appreciated that kind of it was some lighthearted fun yeah we're all hopefully coming out of the pandemic and also it's just really nice to see him having a good time yeah. so much of the time we hear him and he's kind of stressed he's on an earnings call or he's talking about something about something that went wrong here he was just having a good old time dressing up as uh you know wario or right. you know wearing some funny wig and it was just like this is fun and congratulations on the rocket landing and congratulations yeah. on uh you know other the other amazing accomplishments there's that he's so many done. this it's, week Double digit Falcons, oh, SN15. This is just one week in the life of Elon. This and, is crazy. Know, and you know, last week you had astronauts coming back from the International Space Station on a rocket that you built. So it's uh, yeah. pretty impressive. Wow. And I, hey, also want to thank uh, everyone who works for any of these companies. So I want to thank everyone who works at SpaceX, yeah. Tesla, um, Neuralink. You're making uh, all this possible. Boring Company, uh, even OpenAI. Thank you so much to making the world a more fun place for me to exist in because uh, it gives me hope that the future is going to be bright. We'll see you next week. Now, now you know. know.